What if you were a CSA farmer that was given an opportunity to acquire a customer list from a retiring, strong CSA farm? Would you take it? In today's episode, I interview a CSA farmer who did just that. And there were some very interesting and unique challenges that she faced along the way. We're going to break it all down. This is going to be a great episode. Let's get started. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more competent at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 145 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farm CSA out in Elmore, Ohio. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is dedicated to helping other farmers get more confident and proficient in their sales, messaging, and marketing so you can grow your business online and frankly, just make more money. How is everyone doing today? Welcome to the show. If you are new to the podcast, I'm really glad you're here and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe so you can tune in to my future episodes that drop every Wednesday and I encourage you to go check out the first 10 episodes of this podcast. I designed them to be an onboarding ramp into the marketing lingo. And if you are one of my regular listeners, I'm so glad that you're back. This is gonna be a great show. Now, today's show notes can be found at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 145. And before I get started and introduce my guest for today, I want to make a couple of important announcements. So as of the time of this recording's release, My online course and coaching program, CSA Quick Start, is open for enrollment. If you are a new CSA farmer or you're planning to start a CSA and you want some help guiding you through the process of building a framework for your new CSA, going through all the different things that you need to have, the different systems, so that you can build a strong CSA that will last, I encourage you to check it out. You can go learn all about the course and what's inside on the sales page. Just go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash CSA quick start. And the course will be open until February 4th, 2022. So if you're listening to this podcast sometime in the future, after that date, I'm sorry, it's no longer available. You'll have to wait until the following January when we open enrollment again. Now, the second announcement I want to make you aware of is that I am running a free book discussion, a book study during the month of February. We are going to be discussing the book Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And the goal of this book discussion is going to happen on Zoom. It's totally free. Um, We're going to talk about the principles of this book over the course of three different meetings. And the dates are, they're all on Mondays at 1 p.m., February 7th, 14th, and 21st. And the goal of these three discussions is to ultimately figure out what is the why driving your business. Because when you know what that is, oh, you're just going to be so good at finding new clients and getting them to close and convert and become lifelong brand ambassadors for you. So this is a really great book. It's one of my favorites. It's one of the things I give to people as presents. Um, So I want to encourage you to study it with me. If you want to sign up, go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash book study, fill out the form there, and then you'll be taken to the thank you page that tells you Uh, when the dates are, gives you the Zoom link, uh, and gives you even the link to the book if you want to go get it on Amazon. And it'll tell you what your reading assignment is. So I hope some of you will join me. So I hope you have some fun um, discussing it with me. It's going to be just a cool collaboration. All right, that's it for announcements. Let's get on to the good stuff. So today I'm interviewing Eros Lilstrom, and she is a CSA farmer. 
Um, I'll read her bio in just a second. She's actually a member of my online course, CSA Quick Start. She joined it last year. And so we were interviewing her. We, I mean, Lauren Rudersdorf, who's the other co-author of Quick Start with me. We were interviewing her last week in a Facebook Live video inside of my private Facebook group for farmers and marketing. And um, as we were talking with her and kind of asking her some of the unique issues that she has gone through as she scaled her business, she shared this pretty incredible value bomb. So Eros ran into this pretty awesome opportunity where she was able to acquire a CSA customer base from another CSA farmer who was retiring. And they wanted to pass the baton on and pass on their customer base to another strong CSA farm that could do it well. And she acquired this huge list of clients and basically had the CSA farmer um, give their recommendation to their clients as they left the, the business. They said, hey, this is the farmer we recommend and sold them their email list. Now, of course, Eros had to do the work of trying to convince them to actually purchase her CSA share. But to have the recommendation of a lifelong CSA farmer who was really good at what they did very popular in their local town. I just thought, wow, this is a fantastic story. And I wanted her to talk about that. And that's the majority of what this interview is about. So if if any of you have ever wondered, how would I go about acquiring the customer list of another strong CSA? How does that even work? What do you pay for that kind of a thing? What are some of the unique challenges that come along with that? That's what we discuss in this interview. So um, as you grow and scale your CSA and get bigger and bigger, this is one way that you can do it. You can go out and, and acquire a customer base from another business. So let me introduce you to Eris Lilstrom. Eris is the co-owner of Who Cooks For You Farm, which is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She and her partner, Chris Brittenberg, have been running this first generation family farm since 2009. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, they were one of the farms that had to quickly pivot and find new revenue sources fast. They had a strong CSA program already in place, but were given the opportunity to acquire a retiring CSA farm's customer list. Eros now runs an 800-member CSA. She also functions as the office manager, keeping the books in order, the supplies stocked, and produce delivered. She also manages all those customer relations. She's the proud mama of two boys, and I'm so excited to have her on the show. Please join me in welcoming Eros Lilstrom. Well, welcome everyone. We are live in the Facebook group for our series on CSA Farmer Success Stories. And I am joined today by my co-host, Lauren Rudersdorf from Raleigh's Hillside Farm. Hello, Lauren. Hello. And and then I have Eros Lilstrom from Who Cooks For You Farm, who also is a CSA farmer. And we are putting her in the hot seat today. We have a bunch of fun questions for her to share her wisdom Uh, what makes her CSA farm tick, why it's doing so well. And she has a really unique story that I'm excited to share with all of you today. So Lauren, you're going to kick us off with the first question. Yes, yes. Well, we'd love to start just from the beginning, Eros. Tell us where you're at, um, how many acres you're growing on, how many CSA members you have. And then I think you made some pretty big changes in the last couple of years with the size of your CSA. So tell us a little bit about that growth trajectory as well. So we are growing in Western Pennsylvania. We are an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh. And we had last year uh, 825 CSA members. Um, We are certified organic and we've been in business since 2009. We did CSA from 2010 to 2000. 19, 18, and then took a break. And then we came back into it um, in uh, 2021. Oh, I didn't realize there was a break in there too. You took one or two seasons off. 
It was actually three, sorry. Three, three seasons. seasons. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how big were you before you restarted? Like what did you kind of top out at before the break? Like 350. Okay. I think was... And then you came back in 2021. And is that when you grew to the current size that you're at? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's even more interesting than I realized. That's I wonderful. I know. I didn't realize that either that you took a break. Are you a choice CSA? or a traditional we've done we've done like everything last year we were just choice i mean sorry just traditional what we wanted to give everybody is what they got can okay. you tell me a little bit about because as people may or may not know i am actually in the midst of a csa break <laughs> yeah congratulations um, thank you thank you it's, it's a experience it is that i'm excited to kind of reevaluate and reframe things and all of that so yeah i'm personally interested in um what made you decide to come back into CSA after the break and get so much bigger? Like, what did that, what did that look like? Well, a lot of it was due the, to the pandemic. We were 50% because at that break, we were not doing traditional CSA anymore. Um, we were at farmer's markets and we were also at wholesale direct to restaurants. So when the restaurants closed in 2020, we, you know, I, I, I did many different things, but we were, my husband and I run this farm together, just so you know, Chris Brittenberg is my, my other, my better half. Um, and when this, when the restaurants were closing, we did the government share boxes. We took a thousand of those on and that was like, great. Okay. We can keep rolling. That really kept us afloat um, because we lost 50% of our sales um, when the restaurants closed. So um when that year was going on and on we're like knew that it, they weren't going to come back at the force that we needed them to we had a few wholesale buyers buying from us during that time and we were had one um uh wholesaler harvey farms pittsburgh which is like a new part of harvey which is a csa program but they are they were we were wholesaling to them um and they have like sort of a csa of sorts um multiple farmers um so when we we were working with harvey and that they were our biggest customer along with the wholesale or the um, government boxes um but we didn't necessarily want to stick with wholesale because of like that reality check of wow this is we're so vulnerable we have a yeah. lot of food here and we were able to get our food out to the public from the farmers markets and anyone who was on our mailing list in a heartbeat, we created an online ordering system and we were doing custom boxes for the year of 2020 with the pandemic. Um, so doing that really quickly, having the interface to do it with a local food marketplace, it was very simple for us to transition. Um, and we had an opportunity, we're talking with other farmers, what are you doing? And uh, fellow farmer of ours that were, they were retiring, wanting to retire. And they had been looking for people to take over their farm for many, many years, like 10 years. And they hadn't found anyone yet. And they were like, this was going to be their final year. And so we offered, Hey, can we step in and, and like buy your customer base? And, um, and then we just had a, you know, my, it was mostly my husband and he that were talking, um, it was them until the, and the decision was made and then I got involved and we figured out all the logistics of um, bringing those customers in and um, whatnot. Um, but that's, that's how that happened. Okay. So I know that a bunch of people who are listening to this, just their ears just perked up when you said that you acquired a customer base from another CSA farm. Was this CSA farm a strong brand and how many people did they have? And like, how, like, tell, tell us a little bit about, about who this, this clientele was that you inherited. Yeah. So purchased. the, this, they were very well known in this area. They've been farming in this area for a very long time and uh, over 40 years. And so started, they started at farmer's market. So that's how they began their customer clientele. And then they moved to CSA in, in the seventies. So they had, you know, some of their members, it's like, I'm seeing their, their little notes. Oh, I was with them for 26 years. You know, these are many, 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 many years, decades of um, relationships and um, them growing for them. 
so yeah, it's a very long uh, standing farm in our community and they nourished so many families. So the, the main base that, of people that they had as members in 2020 was a thousand members and then they had 500 people on their waiting list. And that wow. was 2020 though. So, you know, like 2020, everyone's like, I just need yeah, to yeah. in my house. And there was a lot of frenzy going on. So that's, I think those numbers were a little high because of that. Not necessarily all those people, I think would have been like a CSA member when you looked at this, maybe 500 on the waiting list. I'm not sure. Okay. So I do just want to dive into this a little more, if you don't mind, because I've never had anyone talk about this scenario. Um, so if somebody wanted to go out and try and acquire another really strong farm brands customer base like how does that work like what are some of the steps you go through in that process um when we sign documentation saying that we would um you know we would basically we're purchasing the a their name in order to like fulfill his dream and goal of continuing to nourish these people and we were continuing to do the same and that is at our deepest value is that we are continuing to feed these families and offer mm -hmm. the certified organic vegetables mm -hmm. um and it was a hundred dollars per person over the course of two years so this gave him a good retirement and it gave us a like a, a more like us more of a sure footing that we would be able to make this business work in such a in a pandemic too it was really like just an amazing opportunity we felt like that we were able to take this on um so you know we're making payments to him and in and, and this is the transition it was very you know there's lawyer documents and mm -hmm. the the ability to just make it formal and so of course he would right. be paid such like that right and and so what does the transition plan look like? I mean, I, I imagine that you you didn't just pass the baton. He didn't just pass the baton to you. No, we got and, a membership list and um, you know, his um just basically a member a member list and that's that's what we um obtained the the current members and then his waiting list and that's all. And if people wanted to get off the list, you know, I took them off a list. Um and you know, it's really nerve wracking at first because you're like, can I do this? Is this OK? And, you know, because people are like, take me off your list. I'm like, OK, sorry. And it's nerve wracking <laughs> all that, all those things. But with it, it says, you know, you must be able to do that. And I made sure I was able to do that with um, we use MailChimp. Yeah. Uh, so I made sure that that was something that was easy for people to do. Um, yeah. And did the did the I farmer kind of introduce you and recommend you like in an email or was there a moment where they said this is who we're passing the baton to yeah they definitely sent email out to their farmer to their customers saying that they this would be their last okay. season and that who cooks for you farm is you know basically taking their um, membership and you know if this is who basically who they recommended they didn't say right. this is who they we're taking their membership but this like they'll be contacting you and okay. um and this is who we recommend and he is recommending us on his website for another year um mm. so that is the partnership in that sense that he's still encouraging because he does still have a website and people he's you know through all the threads of history uh, when people are searching mm -hmm. for csa all of that information is still there so a lot of leads lead to him to their farm um so it it was something that it was that that network of him recommending as well as us saying hello was really key yeah oh it's so, so fascinating oh, i know I and, and we <laughs> and we are not the only farmers that have done this we did um we have heard of there's just i don't know names but like a farmer in eastern pa that had done this and was a lawyer, so knew sort of the formalities of it. So we did take certain steps and we did talk to Simon Huntley from Small Farm Central, Harvey, um, like, hey, what, you know, cause I think he had written in at some point we were like, didn't you write about that in one of your books or one of your somethings of like, how much is a member worth, you know, for sharing. And so that's how we came up with that number. Hmm. Well, and there was, I mentioned this once before, I think in, 
a, just like a live Q and A, but there was a series in the growing for market magazine on what this kind of there, cause there are a couple other farms who've done this where they interviewed a farm who was looking, I think at least one, if not a couple of the farm examples were farms looking to get out of CSA um, either because they were retiring or for one, I think after 15 years, they were just ready to be done with it. And it is it's this beautiful idea of the farm and the community that you built can still continue. And like you're saying, like this farmer, it's paying for a portion of his retirement, like this thing that he built and nurtured for 40 years, it doesn't just disappear if you don't have children who want to continue it. So like, right. yeah, you're providing such an amazing value to this farm and to the community. It's such a, it's so cool to see that done. Um, and what did it look like for you? You know, you had done CSA for several years, then you took a break and then you came back bigger. Um, so what did that even look like, like logistically? Like, how did you set up for that? Did you know you were going to do 800 members because that farm was larger? Did you have to cap it? Like, what did it look like getting back into CSA at such a large scale? Well, we had grown exponentially um, at that point where we stopped CSA. And we, and that's one of the, re it's one of the reasons we actually stopped is that we couldn't get our me member numbers to be high enough to where we need to grow because we were about to, to be um, getting a new piece of land and our rent was increasing and there were just so many things and there were so many restaurants that were like grow for us and it's like if there's someone yelling on a microphone to you and showing up at your farmer's market that want your food you're like I'm not going to not go to these people that want my food so that's how we transitioned to the hiatus of taking the time off of CSA that transition um, we were with 2020 uh, and the pandemic, when we took on those thousand boxes, we were like taking on them in increments of like, okay, we're going to do uh, fifth, uh, 500 here and we're going to do 250 here and 250 here. And it just became like, we were moving so fast. There was just, you know, can we do it? Yes, we can do it. Okay, let's do it. You know, and it was a limited number of items though. Like it was a $15 box. Um, so you know, that was a really good learning year for us in that sense of like, what are, and we could put anything in the box, as long as it was nutritious and fresh and food that we grew, it could go in the box. And so that was a really great opportunity for us to sort of segue back into traditional CSA, which we had done before. And um, so physically, our farm was capable of feeding that many families. Um, we sort of uh, were like, 825 is great. Let's just stop because it was, you know, some of our shares have five items. Some of them have 10 items, but it just, we need to make sure that for the whole entire season, um, will we have enough produce for all of those weeks? And so mm -hmm. also juggling and keeping our markets content, we wanted to make sure that like, we're not going to go any further. So we did cap it at 825. So were there some speed bumps along the way as you decided to jump to that number uh, i mean i know you were growing the food you obviously had a system for harvesting that much but did it require some other um some other new systems to be able to suddenly do twice as many boxes of packing um than you had before like what were some of, i guess and if that isn't it like what were some of the, the yeah the I challenges mean, that you had that you were facing as you scaled I mean, because I did the quick start, honestly, I did not have like, I wasn't like, oh my God, I forgot to make labels. <laughs> <laughs> because like, you know, there were years in my past where I was just like, okay, another year. And, you know, and it, I was just very prepared, very mm. prepared. Thank you, ladies. You just, I mean, honestly, I had boxes to check off because yeah. it was, it's just been chaos. We all been living through the pandemic, but um, that was very helpful for me to in the transition to make sure that I was going to be able to, you know, dot all my I's and cross all my T's on mm -hmm. making sure that customers know where they're going. I do think there's so much value, like you're saying, and like having, having a checklist of everything that you might need to do that might come up because that is CSA is it's amazing. Like it is an amazing, amazing model, but there are a lot of dot, like a lot of I's to mm -hmm. dot and a lot of T's to cross. Like there are a lot of each week, a lot of things. And so, yeah, maybe you could have broke down, like, don't forget to remind people that the fruit share is coming up, put that on your list for next year. But like, 
the fact that that was your main hiccup. Wow. You, you well, I, <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I, they, I did also, I think I'm looking, okay, the read your notes there. So like one of the things that I said, I will write every week, every person will know what they're going to get in their box on Monday. They'll know what they're going to get in their box. That, that could not happen. I was not able to do that. We were not able to give the whole entire week, the same, the same food. Mm -hmm. So Monday got something, Tuesday got something, Wednesday got something, Thursday got something. And it's actually Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, but that made it so like when we realized and we knew we were doing that, but we figured we could stretch it, but it, you know, there's just, Oh no, that didn't happen. This, and it's often, you know, it's either going to be, you know, right. Okay. Someone will get broccoli or broccolini. So, you know, just being able to differentiate what the difference is, how you might use it differently. Um, that was also something that, you know, people were eager to, hey, could you start doing that again? Because I just couldn't keep up. We lost our driver. So that's another hiccup, you know, not having a driver. It's been really hard to find someone. Um, so I was driving and managing the CSA. So, you know, when you stopping a stoplight and you're answering your mem customers, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you're, you're like, you know, it, it's just, there's just so much multitasking that had to happen. Now, do you have any unique issues that you have to handle because you've inherited this other customer base? Um, as you I was move thinking forward. that too. Yeah, yeah. That, that is one. Mm -hmm. uh, That's the main one that I see. Okay, how could we, you know, he offered a lot of bulk items you know, when he was in, in bulk time, like we got a lot of potatoes, we got a lot of tomatoes. We have, you know, he would offer a lot. So we did start doing that and people would write us, Hey, this is what he did. Could you do this? And we're like, oh, Hey, this is what he did. Just like send it down. Like, this is what we got to know. Let's try it. And that was mostly like the buying in bulk and, um, and then the offering, you know, but he had lettuce every week. And I'm like, we're trying to have lettuce every week. You know, it, that is, every farmer's dream to have lettuce every week. And it's sometimes some weeks you're like, it just got burnt. Oh, well, there's no list this week. So there's probably some pressure to, to look a little bit like the brand before. And yet at the same time, this identity struggle, like, well, I'm my own brand, like this is our own deal. And how do we train our new customers to slowly like see us as the brand, you know? And I imagine that that's probably a multi-year transition that wouldn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just kind of an interesting question to ponder. Like, what are some of the unique challenges that you have to face as the second business owner or as the, the second owner of these customers? How do you, how do you turn them into your, into your clients? Like, have you thought about that? You know, I'm like, I really feel like, it's the good food that's gonna that's going to bring people. Once they try the food, they're gonna be like, "This is great food. Let's go get it." We're certified organic. We have all the certification. We, you know, people who meet us who get to come out to the farm, like like the I forget what podcast or something you did recently, Corinna. You know, it's just like meeting your members, having that relationship. It is so important, and we do live. It's hard, hard for us. We live an hour and a half from the majority of our customers, so getting anyone out to the our farm on an event, we're like, everybody, we're having an event. And we get like, I think the most we've ever had was a hundred, but that was one, like maybe twice they think we've had, and those were paid events. So that's actually brought more people than any of our free events. Um, but like our tomato tasting, you know, we'll get 25 people. If we're lucky, we get 15, but they're intimate and it's awesome. And we remain friends with them forever. And it's great. You know, we're like, we're buddies. And, and we, even if we only met once, like they'll shoot me an email, I'll shoot them an email and it's forming that relationship has been great. It's been awesome when some people come to the farmer's market and introduce themselves, or they just write me an email and introduce themselves. And it's been really wonderful, you know, just to be able to have that relationship and try and build it. But it is over time. Like you said, Corinna, it's, it's just going to take time. So the pickup sites are people's houses and the owner of the house is the host. All of his host sites were totally game. Um, so that's been really key at having them on board and they've been wonderful and really, they are so seasoned, which is also really wonderful. I'm thinking about how oh, this transition that you're having to make has been made easier because there was already 
a system in place that you really just had to inherit as well. So when you think about the power of the site host, the site host mm -hmm. has the relationships with those customers already. So it really, I don't want to say you don't matter because clearly you do, but like their, their relationship was first and foremost with the site host, right? That was the person they maybe were seeing every week and right. communicating with. And now you just have to kind of bring yourself into that system and become the next farmer face that goes along with it. But that's what's beautiful about this is that you already had the skeleton. Um, yeah, we, we right. walked in to a, a, a totally usable skeleton. And just the fact that every member, every host was totally willing and so excited um, and really excited, you know, that yeah. was that they were like, we're totally ready. Let me know how I can help. And it's amazing. Um, so it was really, really supportive. We we jumped into a really supportive embrace at a really intense time, you know, like the pandemic and us, like possibly not knowing how we were going to sell our food that next coming year. Um, it was, it's been a really big deal. It's been amazing. I love this. Thank you. You have, you're just such a unique story and I appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom with us today. Where can people reach out and learn more about you? You might get some phone calls from people who are like, I want to do what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we're online at whocooksforyoufarm.com. That's the best way to reach us. Um, and yeah, any questions, I'd be more than happy to help. Ladies, this was fun. Thank you again for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. So I'm back. Before I close out the episode, I want to spend a little bit of time highlighting some of the unique issues that Eros brings up in this kind of a scenario. When you acquire another farmer's customer list, another customer's loyal fan base. So number one, um, she talked about how there is a process for legally transferring or acquiring that customer list. To buy out a list, you don't just get the email list and send them this massive spammed email. But there's actually a legal process for how to go about doing this. And although she didn't spell it out in super great detail, if you decide to go this route, make sure that you seek legal advice on how one essentially transfers this side of someone else's business into your own. Um, these customers obviously have huge value because the cost of acquiring a new lead, much less a new customer, can be very high, especially for a CSA farmer. So we want to make sure that we learn what is the value of that strong customer base and make sure that we compensate that farmer accordingly. Now, one of the other things that comes up is that Eros is going to have to learn over the next few years how to turn this customer base into her own. And this is one of the unique challenges that comes with this situation. Here you have a, a group of community members who have been loyal to this farmer for like 20, 25 years. That's a really long time. And they have certain rituals and certain ways of doing the CSA that they're used to. And when you come into that ecosystem as a CSA farm, you might have different expectations or different hopes and dreams for how logistically the CSA should run. You may not want to do all the perks and features that that former CSA did. So how do you transition your client base so that they can understand why you might want to do things differently? Maybe you don't want to run the CSA pickup sites quite the same way. Maybe you want to have fewer of them. Maybe you don't want to do a choice CSA, right? You have so many different ways of working things through and you have to somehow help your new clients transition into you being the farmer and how you run things. And that's going to take time, but there are some uh, intentional strategies and systems that you can build out on the front end before you sign up that new customer. You kind of have a come to Jesus moment with them and say, hey, you know, this coming year, we might do some of the things the way you've always done them. But as we move forward, expect there to be some adjustments and changes because we run things a little bit differently on our farm. And navigating that particular journey is 
is going to be tough for sure. Now, on the flip side, one of the great benefits that Eros pointed out is that when you inherit this strong customer base, you also um, inherit the system that it's built on. So she didn't have to reinvent the wheel. She didn't have to go out and find all these customer pickup sites or recruit the site hosts that have the relationships with the clients. She can just tap right into that and keep it running the way it always has so that there's only a very slight interruption. And then the goal becomes, well, now I have to turn myself into the face of the farmer instead. But the rest of the team is just moving like it always had. And what a great gift that is for her, not having to train the customer in how the workflow even goes from week to week. They already know that. And there's really not a huge interruption. Another thing that came into mind as I was reflecting on this conversation was how the the farmer who is retiring, who's passing on this customer list, how he or she is going to be highly motivated to make sure that the future farmer that takes on his legacy is really good at what they do. I'm just putting myself in their shoes you know, my I love my clients. Many of them have been with me for 10, 10 years or more. And if they stay with me another 10 years, 10, 15 years, and then I retire, um, I'm going to really care about them. And I'm not going to want to just pass my customer list on to any old farmer that comes to me and says, hey, can I buy your list off of you? I'm going to really think through who do I want to take on this legacy of mine? Who's going to do a good job? Who deserves this? Who can do this well? And I'm going to be looking for experience and people who have the same values because the worst thing that could happen is that I pass on this treasured gift, this amazing group of people, and then they are let down or it's not what they thought or it falls apart and unravels. That would just feel like such a loss. I would almost rather just end the CSA cleanly rather than give it to a farm that's going to splinter it apart with mismanagement. So just be aware if you find yourself in this situation that that retiring farmer will probably be interviewing you (laughs) to make sure that this is indeed a good fit. And you want to make sure that the values that you have are the same. Maybe even take a look at how they run their CSA how those systems are set up and ask yourself that question, well, I'm probably going to have to keep it this way for a while as we go through that transition. Am I willing to do that? And maybe you're not. Maybe it's not going to work in your workflow and it would create too much disruption and stress and anxiety for your clients. Maybe it's not a good idea to do it, right? So just kind of think all that through and be aware that um, this is a gift to the farmer if they successfully find a good match and can say, I want to pass this on to you. I know you would do a great job. How amazing that would feel for that farmer to know that their legacy will live on and thrive because of what you can do uh, with them. But they're also going to look at the flip side and make sure that you can do that. They're not going to want to pass it on to someone that's just going to mismanage it, right? And finally, I was just thinking about how this is a great way to scale your CSA quickly. I mean, if you can fall into something like this and it's a good match, this could be phenomenal. Um, But again, there's kind of two sides to this coin. You'll have some big shoes to fill. Um, That farmer will have really created a strong sense of brand identity that you're going to have to reshape. And that is not an easy thing to do. Um, So make sure that you're in it for the long haul, but also make sure that you have the systems that are required, the experience that is required to be a CSA of that kind of scale. And I think that's where, that's actually the reason why Eros came and joined CSA Quick Start because she knew she was about to acquire this huge customer base. And she wanted to make sure before she stepped into that space that she had all of those different elements on the checklist down, right? She didn't want to inherit this group of people suddenly, you know, double, triple in size and then realize, oh, oh man, I didn't realize I have to have this system in place. 
So before you step into a big opportunity like that, you will need to have amazing systems and they will need to be firing on all cylinders. So just take a look at what those are. Make sure that framework is strong before you say yes to this or you could end up imploding. So those are just some thoughts that I had. I'm just so excited that Eros um, shared this little detail with us because I've never had anyone talk about it yet on my podcast. There's obviously a lot more of research you would have to do if this is an opportunity that falls into your lap. But I hope this has been a good resource for you to think through if you have to navigate those tricky waters. Well, that's all I got today. You can check out the show notes at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 145. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. I'm now sharing a uh, Instagram story roughly every other day there. If you want some marketing tips or your little marketing vitamin of the day, I would love to have you follow me there. Go to at mydigitalfarmer and check that out. And don't forget, CSA Quick Start is now open until February 4th, 2022. We'd love if you would check out this awesome online course and coaching program. We are going to walk you through step-by-step how to build your own CSA from scratch and get all the systems in place, build that framework in under 60 days. It is an amazing program. I'm super proud of it. And you can learn more by going to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash CSA quick start. Thanks for joining me for another awesome week. And I will catch you next time on the podcast. Have a good one. Bye-bye.